trick of the devil that they shall appear. We're not here because we're free. We're here because we're not free. There's no escaping reason, no denying purpose. Because as we both know, without purpose, we would not exist. Jude Ray, what do you want to do tonight? The same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. My God, it would be beautiful. This is the World Magic Movement. Tonight's episode, The Thunderbolt. My name's S. Rob, and I am talking to Sol Ravencraft. Hello, Rob. Hello, Sol. So you sent me some information about what we're going to try this time with our little occult excursion, and I didn't fully understand. You mentioned some entities uh, that I am not as familiar with as you are, and I'm trying to understand what we're going to experience. Okay, what I'll be doing basically is turning uh, Kal Fu, and he is the evil twin of Papa Legba, and Papa Legba is the voodoo man basically, uh, and turning Kal Fu inside out so that the crossroads of Kal Fu, through which all evil and misfortune enters the world, is changed into the square of Uflak. Uh, now this hasn't been done before because, you know, it's basically also... Uh, creating knowledge of a new voodoo law which nobody knew about and to do this I'm also using uh, a staff I've got called the Titfield Thunderbolt and I actually used that in a ritual where I was uh, with some other people where we're stealing power from the Spear of Destiny, the one in Vienna which has all of the provenance and putting it in my spear which I actually still have uh, so I'm doing that and I'm also trying to bring forward you know uh, voodoo, uh, sorry, uh, video occultism because really, uh, this is something that I started, no one else is really doing it. People teach occultism through video, but people don't really work it through video. And so, uh, as I'm trying to move it forward, and because the staff itself uh, is called the Titfield Thunderbolt, and that is actually uh, named after a, an old Ealing film. So what I did was, within the ritual itself, you haven't just got the sigil and that, you've also got a little section of the uh, tiny section from the trailer of the old film, The Titfield Thunderbolt, which fits in well because my thinking was, I'm trying to turn something negative into something positive. So by adding this funny section into it, I'm actually, you know, giving it greater power. You know, not just making people feel better, but really releasing, you know, good fortune and things into the world, you know, and dragging the evil out. Because that's really what I'm trying to do, drag the evil out of the world instead of release it. Because normally Carl Fu releases it all. Not just devils and demons, but also bad luck and stuff like that. So I'm trying to draw it out of the world. So it means that effectively it's like the talisman has turned the other way. This is the hidden side. So it drags it out of the world. And so it goes into the voodoo realm. So it's going you know, from our world back. Rather than just being released continually into our world. Okay. So, for our, uh, our viewers, our listeners, what will we expect as you perform this ritual? What, what should happen to us? Well, I feel what should happen is that people should have a better life. If people have had bad luck, it will remove the bad luck. You know, it will just make people's lives better. And also the world generally, you know, you can play this as many times as you want, you know, and it will help. Okay. Well, uh, I'm ready when you are. I'm ready now. Well, let's begin. I am now about to use one of the most powerful magical tools that exists. We want the Titfield Thunderbolt. Out of the museum? Yes, yes, you run. She's as good as ever she was. I'll stake my living on it. And this is the Titfield Thunderbolt herself. I'm now going to perform a ritual to turn the crossroads of Kalfu inside out. Meaning that instead of releasing evil and misfortune into the world, it will instead draw it out of the world. Meaning it will effectively be facing the other way around. And I'm going to do this now. Papa Legra, powerful voodoo lore. You are the voodoo man and the gateway is yours to control. 
You walk with a limp because you have one foot always in one world and one foot in the other. Pack my leg but open the gateway. Open the gateway here and now. Open the gateway. Pack my leg but open the gates. The gateway is open. Cal Fu. Papa Legba's evil twin. You are the crossroads that the evil and misfortune come through into the world. Kalfu, come through the gateway, come through the gateway here and now I command you. Kalfu, come through the gates and is here with me. I now use your power. I command you, Kalfu. You are transformed. You are turned inside out. You are now Ufla. You are the square. The square which draws all evil and misfortune from the world. And this is what I do to you. So it is and will be. Papa Legba, close the gateway, close the gateway here and now. Papa Legba, close the gate. So it is and will be. And we are back. Yes, we are. Well, I have to admit to you, I do feel a little better. Yeah, that's good, you know, because this talisman is here to help the world and the ritual's here to help the world. But, you know, quite a lot has really uh, came out of, of that ritual and the idea, you know. There's the book, Inside Out Talismans, but there's also, it's revealed a new way of thinking about things. Because we always assume that magical beings, you know, you've maybe got your devils and, and then you've got your angels and stuff like that. But it's revealed they all have a hidden side. You know, it's if if you look at the old book of Dremel and the Mage, it means that all of those magic squares have an accompanying cross. So it's basically doubled, uh, not maybe not quite doubled, but almost doubled the talismans in the world. And it's also revealed a hidden side to these magical beings that they all have a balancing side. So that means that even a devil has a balancing side. Now that's not to say that that side is necessarily good. But that it has that other side to it, you know, you can use it for good, you can command it to do good. And also an angel. And that isn't that controversial when you think of, you know, the great flood, you know, uh, Noah's Ark. You know, that's a negative side to things, isn't it, really? So it, it means that when you're looking at these magical beings, there isn't just one. For every one, there's also this other side. Uh, and it's sort of like... And inside out, it's the other side to it. But it is like a distinct separate entity in many ways. You know, all talismans have this other side. Uh, and also, it's revealed that, as they say to call, you know, if you call one plus, the one becomes one becomes a minus version, a negative version. But not negative in terms of bad. Because I don't want to get linked with the idea that one's good and one's bad. Because I don't really feel that's what we're talking about. You know, it's like a coin. It might have a head on one side and a tail on the other, but tails on the other, but you know, they're both circular. Do you know what I mean? They are both yes. what they are. And that's really uh what we're talking about there. But there's also the guy who founded the new Catholic line of Judah Church. And, you know, he's looking into it as well from a theological background. That, you know, this could be and it looks like it's gonna be a great theological leap forward. And I've also written the book uh uh, inside out leprechaun magic I think that's the name of it but you know I've written that one as well uh, and they have another side as well and the strange thing is this magic is really really powerful and potent uh, in some ways people seem to report that it's more potent than the magic when it's used the, the uh, conventional way around so there's a whole new area of occultism has opened up because of this a whole new way of doing it you know, it's a very exciting discovery, a very exciting thing to have done and, and uh, to have founded, basically. It's great. Absolutely. And you say that people can uh, can re-experience this ritual uh, to, uh, d does it make sense to, to repeat it? Will it do you good to repeat it? It will definitely do good to repeat it, yeah, to, re to play that part, to play the whole show. Well, it will help, you know, that's what it's there for. Uh, and it also, I feel, it's brought forward the whole video cultism thing because basically, you know, everyone else who tries to do occultism with video teaches it but doesn't do anything with it. Where what I'm doing is uh, I'm working it through video, you know, and I've added also to the way it's done. So you don't just have to use, uh, like I've done there, normally use like, uh, you know, a ritual, and I've also used like special effects at times, although I didn't really there, uh, or, or talismans, you can also use, uh, you know, like clips from film and things like this, all the things from film, 
uh, and all the sort of visual effects can be used within this way of new way of doing magic. So it's an extremely exciting time, you know. It's an extremely exciting development in all ways. It seems to be uh, a great leap forward. Well, absolutely. And I hope that anyone that uses this will try to include it and let us know what they experience. Let us know if it makes any changes. Absolutely, yeah. You know, it, it's really great. You know, and certainly any feedback we can get from anyone at all is certainly very helpful. And it also can help to spread the word. Because a lot of people out there have bad luck and unfortunate circumstances. And, you know, maybe a lot of the evil in the world could be uh, removed from the world using this, you know, using this method and, and that film. Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, I don't know whether that includes Morris men, but, you know, are them funny guys you get, you know, with top hats and gloves and, and canes and things and cards? Maybe, sure. maybe one or two. Maybe one or two of them get dragged through. I will, uh, I will explore it myself some more and see what I experience. And I look forward to seeing what our, uh, what our followers experience as well. That's great. Great to hear from you, Sol Ravencroft. Excellent. Thank you. That's Rob. Hello, my name's S. Rob, and I am talking to Freddie Valentine. Hello. Uh, hi there, Freddie. And yeah. we were going to talk about Atlantis. Yes. Was Atlantis real? Is it fictional? Is it, is, it, is it a fictional thing? Is it a real thing? That's what we need to know. That's what we need to wonder. That's true, yeah, because it was originally uh, talked about by Plato. Yeah. And even at the time, people were uncertain as whether it was real or not. You know, what I feel is important, though, is that people automatically think whenever we talk about, anyone talks about mythical or potentially mythical lands and advanced yeah. civilizations. Everybody sort of always thinks, ah, but that's all the stuff that we have now. You know, we've got all that stuff here. Uh, so I thought I'd like to say uh, what happened to me yesterday, just to give some sort of an insight into it. Yesterday, I was trying to get some glasses I'd ordered. Uh, but it took a week to get them. And, you know, picking out glasses with a tint isn't easy because the tint, uh, you know, you've got to guess what they're going to look like. It changes what they look like. So when I got there, they had completely the wrong tint. So they had to get, <clears throat> you know, they're having to get redone again. All I'm saying is, you know, Atlantis was supposed to be a land of, you know, of uh, an advanced civilization, yeah. but also, at least at the start, a place of harmony. Now, all I'm thinking was, if I was walking into an optician in, Atl in Atlantis, if they had them, I yeah. can't see it being a case, you know, that Norbert, uh, you know, got pissed in 94 and didn't do the, uh, the, the no. lenses, right? I can't see it. I mean, I can't even find a chip shop exactly, yeah. that does chips that, that are actually cooked, because they're just sitting there and thinking, sod it, he's got a microwave, he can cook them when he gets home. So, so when everybody thinks, oh, we've got all this stuff now, we actually don't. We don't really have harmony. You can't even get what you're supposed to get when you pay for it. And that certainly is not harmony. No, and they're saying that they're, that they're an advanced civilization who could bring peace to the world. Apparently that's one of the, one of the things that, about Atlantis, people say. And funny enough, I, was, I did meet someone who claimed they were from Atlantis. Uh, it was, almost, uh, it was a psychic, uh, one of these psychic events, big psychic fairs they have, you know, the, the mind, body, spirit, I think. And she said that she was from Atlantis, she was an Atlantan. Uh, she was a water sign by a star sign, and she said that she, when she was born, she had dolls by the thumbnail. Um, so whether she was crazy and just believed that, or whether she actually was, who knows? You know, maybe she was, but she claimed that she, you know, she felt better in in, in the water, swimming or underwater. Yeah, that's interesting because the Atlanteans were supposed to be half gods and half men, which always leads modern people to think, oh, well, they must have looked like us, but maybe they didn't. Yeah. You know, they could have looked completely different. If you if you're half god and half man, who's to say that you're going to look human? You know. I mean, I know some people have said that the uh, Egyptian god Thos came from Atlantis. I don't know how they say that, because Egypt is well before the uh, ancient Greeks. So it's a, you know, it's a difficult thing, a connection to make. But the idea that they could have looked very different, maybe they had, uh, you know, different heads or animal heads. It could look like anything at all, because, you know, it's just a modern interpretation, isn't it, that they must have looked like us. Yeah, I'm assuming they were people. The, the, the initial thing was that it was, just, it was a normal, like, a... Uh... City of Atlantis, but it's sunk underwater, so there's normal people living on it, but they had this higher ability, you know, but there is, I'm sorry, they have adapted to the underwater life, so they're half aquatic sort of people now. Um, remember the program, the TV program, The Man from Atlantis in the 70s? Yeah, I mean, 
what I think is interesting is is the idea that said it was a continent. It's so big, it's got or it's got so many people. It's like a lost continent. And now that was interesting. But an interesting thing is, a lot of these mythical lands seem to be below ground, and Atlantis was never connected as being like below the ground as such. You know, at one point you're below the sea, but you know it was never connected as being. You know, you had to like dig a hole to get there. You know, it wasn't really linked with that at all. But there's been a number of locations linked to Atlantis, and there's been a number of, of uh, archaeologists have said that they've found it. So that it's not like there isn't civilizations that have, have sank under the sea, uh, because it's happened before. Uh, an interesting thing is, one of the locations is off Spain, and that was said to be a location for the mythical land of Cocaine. You know, people looked for it and couldn't find it. But there is actually something off the coast of Spain. It's not on the right, exactly the right location. But so there's one there. Although Cocaine was quite different because that was said to be a place of uh, plenty. You know, it was like uh, like the song, like a sort of uh, smutty version of the song, the, the the Big Rock Candy Mountain. You know, where, where you've got food flying into your mouth and things like this. Uh, you know, so that would be sort of like Atlantis at the end, when I suppose when it was supposed to have sank and the people were supposed to have became, you know, greedy and petty and things like that, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's strange. Some people say it's off Spain and other people say it's off Russia and Turkey, um, in the Atlantic Ocean, Germany, Malta, Caribbean. There's all different theories about it. And it's, it's interesting because I remember, it came out, basically 1969, I think, it's Charles Bullitz, you know, the guy who wrote all the um, language courses, them language learning things, like you put the headphones on and learn Spanish yeah. or whatever, or Italian. Um, he wrote a book called The Mystery of Atlantis. And he said it's a, it's a sort of the Bermuda Triangle mystery. That's, it's, so it's around the Atlantic Ocean, it's through the Bermuda Triangle. That was where the, the actual triangle was, where, where Atlantis is. So Atlantis is a very powerful place, and that's what caused the Bermuda Triangle. It sucked these planes down to Atlantis, is what he claimed. Yeah. Probably it is, but who knows? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is very, it's also a place of India. Uh, which is called Kuman Kandam, and that's supposed to be a lost civilization. But what's interesting yeah. there, though, is in India there was the Indus Valley civilization. Not very much is known about the Indus Valley uh, people, except that they're different from all of the ancient civilizations because in their city, the largest building is not a temple or a church, it's actually a warehouse. And the center have had a great shipping empire. Uh, and they also got destroyed, but they got destroyed by basically what some people say is a nuclear bomb, and it's still radioactive today. Some people say that it was actually a, a geological thing, and it's taken, you know, geologists this long to work out that geology could have actually caused that explosion. Uh, and it would be a nuclear explosion, which is why if you go into the city itself, uh, you have to wear like radiation suits and things like this, because otherwise you just can't go in safely. But the interesting thing to me is, the Indus Valley people, there's not very much uh, known about them. So the first thing I thought was, if you had a shipping empire, you know, when the British Empire was a large shipping empire, it ended up owning various places. Obviously, that isn't the route they took, or there'd be more proof of them. But if the route they took instead was to make a series of outposts, that's what they'd end up yeah. with. They'd create things like Atlantis, because what you'd have is, and they'd have the wealth, because they had a huge shipping empire, and they were trading all the time. And they'd create something like Atlantis quite easily, because they'd already have the money to bring it in, and the education and everything they needed, just to, you know, find an island and create it. You know, so it's not like it's, you know, out of the realm of possibility. You know, and it could be what we're talking about is the Indus Valley civilization is their trading empire. Could in fact be several of these Atlantis uh, locations. It could be. I mean, one of the, one of the stories is saying that the people that lived there were extraterrestrials. They were aliens, and said so they were they were much taller and fair skinned than today's average human being. They were like a, a you know, like when you get these um, UFO stories where you get these Nordic looking people. They're very tall, very very fair skinned, and come to bring peace or war mankind. Yeah, you have these. Because you get the grey aliens a lot now, but it's also the, in the 50s, there was these other people very, like very modern, you know, they could have looking like that, you know. Uh, and they originally came to the city about 50,000 years ago from the Lyrian solar system. And the average lifespan of it was 800 years. And they, apparently that's the people that came there. They had the powers, they could morph all to control the weather. Um, and they liked unpleasant weather. They, they liked thunderstorms and, and calm waters. And they, they could control the weather, these powers. So there's all these sort of um, myths 
and legends about it. About I mean, they were, you know, as the same way with animals, they're extinct. They've got human races that are now extinct, and they were one of them because they were supposed to have been um, giant call. They're very raised giants call. And I did read a book where someone reckoned they found a skeleton of a giant in Cornwall, like a race of giants who lived in Cornwall. I don't know if they had any powers, they were just giants, but, um, you know, they're races or, or like, maybe species of animals, there might be different species of humans or different races of humans that are now extinct. And lanterns, if they are this sort of extraterrestrial race, they, they may have been wiped out by whatever happened to it, you know, or they've gone back to their own planet. Yeah, well, I think, really, uh, when you look at some of the really advanced, you know, technology, little glimpses of it in the past, it does make you think like the Baghdad battery. Whichever way you look at it, that really shouldn't have been there at the time. Mm. Uh, and some people try to say, well, it's not really a battery. But you look at it, really, why would you have, you know, uh, you know uh, metal uh, things going down into somewhere you're keeping uh, that's keeping wine? There's no sense in it, really. Why would you make a container with, uh, with metal prongs sticking in it? There's, there's, no, there's no reason for it. But it does work as a battery, because batteries basically work on corrosion. And they get that and you get a flow of electrons, but, you know... That's fairly advanced physics, you know, even today people don't really uh, go into electronics that much, you know. Uh, I suppose the thing is, I always thought that some of these uh, mythical islands that people find are basically like a time slip. Because I don't know if you've noticed, uh, time slips are dimensional slips, I should say. You rarely see them when people are stationary. People always seem to be walking. You know, it's always you're walking here and then you end up in this time or you end up in some basic, maybe you see aliens or some strange dimension. But people always seem to be travelling. And I always thought on board a ship is perfect because you could travel there and back and not know it. And you could see how it would happen so easily. The on board a ship with all separate anyway, because they're on, you know, they all got this joint experience of being on the craft, same craft. And... They're going along, and many people believe that water would be like uh, would be a, a, an ancient element would help to move this, help it to happen. You know, uh, you know, and they're drifting along, and the change they could change yeah. to another dimension, and not realize it. You know, it happens. It's supposed to happen gradually anyway. Things sort of blur in. So you find an island, and then you go up the island and you walk around, and it, you, you probably put it on your map, and you say, "This is great. I've discovered this great island of Atlantis or Cocaine or whatever." And then, of course, you go back. And you give people the destination, and people are probably quite excited. And then other people go there and can't find it, and you can't understand why they can't. You know, it would it would be so uh, simple when you think about it. And that you know, yeah, and I've always thought it probably happens a lot on board ship, and people don't realise it. You know, the a lot of the time they won't say anything. It'll just look like another stretch of ocean, you know. They go there and back, they just know the radio stops working, it starts working again, they don't know anything's happened, you know. It could happen all the time. Yeah. I mean, it's, people have looked into this or tried to find it. There's a bloke I've been mean, recently, the last couple of years, he's, he's a researcher, um, like an archaeologist, and he's looking for Atlantis. He believes it's there, he believes it's true. And he thinks it's based on an Egyptian story. Like, Damn, you know, it's a true story. And, and even as there's some inscriptions in, in the pyramids or some hidden hieroglyphs that give you a, 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 a clue to the location for it. And they, reckon, they reckon also a few years ago they found this metal or, or a calum, or a, a ripple come, I think it's called, uh, that Plato reckon was found in the city of Atlantis. It's recovered from a ship that sunk off the coast of Sicily about 2,000 years ago. And this, this is a metal that's not found anywhere else. And according to Plato, it's, you can only find this in Atlantis. So by finding this metal, it's all, maybe there's something in it. Yeah, that is interesting, isn't it, when you, you've got yeah. uh, a metal like that, because it gives you... Yeah. A strong indication, doesn't it, of where it is. But the interesting thing is that if you think about it, the Atlanteans weren't supposed to be greedy or, yeah. you know, they had a life of harmony. And that would make more sense to, a, to a come from the outside like an alien rather than uh, from us humans. Because if you think about it, it tends to work the reverse. To get the education and the harmony and yeah. the things you want, we tend to only have to be greedy. It all comes down to trade, you know. Uh, you know, you'd, first of all, maybe, I don't know, I mean, Atlantis was supposed to be a large place, but we'll assume it was like a fishing village. So you, you've got your fish and you have some fish left over, so you trade it somewhere else. And you realise you're not getting much for your fish, so you take that money and you buy some cloth. And then, you know, and then it can build it up like that. Because it, when I was thinking about Atlantis, I did realise wealth in the past was completely different. Because, you know, it's like in the third world today, yeah. farmers don't necessarily own the land. So it's not really worth anything, they're just sitting there, you know. No one actually owns it, you know. Businesses don't have shares, and if you don't have shares, you can't sell businesses. Uh, 
you've still got gold and silver and jewels and things which you can sell but basically all you've actually got is gold jewels and stuff which would be money and income it seems like it would all be about income so if a place uh, was to concentrate on the mental aspects of things and trading, they could have an advantage over farming because they don't need the resources, you know? Yes. Uh, you know, you don't need the resources. Yeah, if, you, if you can sell double the amount of cloth that you bought, you've doubled your profit. But a farmer would need twice the amount of land. They, you hear you all know, these stories the about Atlantic advanced civilizations from like a thousand years seems ago. Seems to be like, linked you know, with, uh, like you know, Eagles being knowledgeable like as well. And, so, and stuff like that from years ago. I remember going to this, uh, there's an exhibition, it's not there now, it's in Blackpool, called the Blackpool UFO Museum. And this guy, he was a bit of a David Icke type, you know, fully into it all. Um, and he had these, these pictures on the wall. He's you know, look at that, it's a helicopter. If you look at that, it looks like a computer, you know, a PC, laptop, whatever. You look at that, it looks like a mobile phone. All these things were there. And it did look like what he was saying, you know, these were lots of yeah. you know, so you're thinking, yeah, maybe, maybe these things did happen, maybe they didn't, maybe they were advanced, you know, but they reckon they found batteries and stuff like that in these times, you know, in, from the, those times, which, which we didn't believe in. But there's also a theory that things slip through time, you know, like, uh, like an object, say from now, you know, like, like a mobile phone could slip through a time portal and land back in the Egyptian times, and people find it, think, oh yeah, the phones are in time. But it's basically still a time portal. Yeah, and I suppose for that you got people slip through as well. So, yeah. you know, it transfers of knowledge, you know. Yeah, there'd be time portals that were different. And, and, yeah, and the I mean, object, you know, there's sort of an object falls back in time, and then we find it 2,000 years later. We're going to think, oh, you know, uh, that, that maybe they had mobile phones or batteries or whatever in that time, basically, yeah. time or maybe they were an advanced civilization who did create these things. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, what really interests me about it is the way that people have really, uh, really hooked onto Atlantis more than any of the other, uh, you know, of these type of civilized, any of the other of these ideas. You know, I mean, the land of Cochrane never got the publicity that Atlantis did. And on the surface of it, it would seem to be, to be, uh, even more alluring because basically speaking in the land of cocaine sex was readily available all the time anytime you wanted so was food drink the longer you slept in the more money you got paid you know you, you got paid for going to the pub on the on the surface of it you'd think that it you know it it pulls in all to people's uh you know basic desires all the basic things people want but yet people seem far more interested in atlantis which maybe that proves that there's good in humanity. We're not just about, you know, what we can indulge in. That we're actually far more than that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I say it's it's, uh, it's something that, that does make sense. Um, there's theory. It's finding the wish is the right one on the right getting on the right track with it, really. Yeah, I mean, I must admit, I am interested in the yeah, the Bermuda Triangle one. That sounds interesting, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, it's like, it's like a portal know, underneath. It, it you know, I mean, it's sucking in. things down there. It's a powerful place. You know, in a place of energy or magic or spiritual power, they could easily do that. Yeah, exactly, yeah. But, you know, it's been linked with so many locations. That's what made me think originally about the Indus Valley Civilization. Yeah. Because the idea that it could have different trading posts, you know... It, do, it does actually make more sense because it seems that yeah. they know they were a powerful trading civilization, but there's no proof of it because they traded. And you think, well, I, but it does sort of make sense because to me, if you had a large geological event, which was the size that it created a basically a nuclear explosion, that size of, of movement of the, of the, you know, of your plates in the uh, earth has got to cause surely. Uh, volc volcanic eruptions and all sorts of things which if they were using an island or islands as stop-off points or as other places to live would destroy them or pull them underground you know uh, yeah. under, sorry under the uh, water so it does seem to link in but there's not I mean there's not an exact link there because there's not much known about the Indus Valley either there's not much known about them you know but yeah but that's but that's interesting the idea that they were half God as well, because that seems to, as you say, things that come from somewhere else, you know, that you're not talking about necessarily uh, just humans, that you're talking people from, you know, maybe from outer space or somewhere else, you know. You know, and that is an interesting idea, isn't it, you know? It is to me, anyway. Yeah. It, is, it is something you've got to think about. Like I say there's so many theories here, but it would be interesting if someone did finally find Atlantis, and there's so many things over the years 
that, that people have mysterious, you know, mysterious things, like not this monster, Atlantis, places like that. And with the technology we've got now, the scanners and things like this, and just reading things, x-rays, you think by now that people would find it, unless, of course, money's not being put into researching these things. There's obviously more important things in the world in some people's eyes than looking for Atlantis or what this monster. But yeah, uh, with the technology we've got now, if we looked hard enough, unless it sunk very, very deeply down, Atlantis could, I don't know how far down the ocean it, it sank, you know, and it, over time, you know, things erode, the, the tide may have got higher. You don't know, it could be under there, you know? Yeah. I suppose the thing is, though, we've also got our own interpretation of it. Would we necessarily recognise it if we saw it? Because the idea of a place of advancement and harmony may not be one that we have now. Because we tend to think of this all as about stuff, you know, that being advanced is about, you know, having machines that do things. You know, uh, uh, things like architecture. What is good architecture? It's all about the individual view, isn't it? So it could look completely different to how we think it is. We may have discovered it already and not realised it, you know, seeing it through their perspective, through their eyes back then. Yeah. Exactly. It's, I mean, there's a different world in those times. I mean, you think that people, when people get out here, they, they assume they're simplistic or very simple people. But then you have people like Plato, they were quite advanced thinkers, you know, a more of a their obsession with social media and reality TV. So, yeah, they're some very deep thinkers. They weren't distracted by stuff. Like, now we've got so many distractions with you know, the internet and films and stuff like that, whereas they didn't have any of that. So you did get a lot of, like, that, a lot of distractions and people like that would put more advanced than a lot of people you get today. Some of their theories may be wrong, but they were deep, deep thinkers, you know. Um, so, you know, to, people tend to assume that, oh, this 2,000 years ago, they were very primitive people. Um, but, that, you know, the Egyptians and you know, these are very elaborate things they created, and a lot of deep stuff came from around that era. So there was a lot, lot going on there. It was much more advanced in some ways than we are today. Yeah, I mean, people forget that the ancient Egyptians invented yeah. the chair. Now, this seems yeah. fundamental to us, but you know what? Think about it, exactly. they invented exactly. the I chair. Before people sat on a rock or something else. I mean, that is, you think it, it is genius, isn't it? Because you can't think of a chair unless you've got one. You know what I mean? Exactly. You know what another thing is about it? They believed that yeah. uh, if they didn't make it out of uh, natural looking parts, that it would cause a disruption uh, in the world. This is an interesting thing. That I saw a picture once of an Egyptian chair. And you know, like the, the lion sort of... Uh, uh, the line sort of feet that you get on on the bottom of, of chairs and all this and it, it it looked like a chair that could have came from maybe just a maybe a couple of hundred years ago or a hundred years ago so which basically means that for thousands of years furniture makers and designers have basically been copying the ideas of the ancient Egyptians that they had thousands of years ago you know yeah. it, but this particular chair looked exactly like it could have been hundred years ago or even a rate reduction. And it had like the ball type line feet to have, and it, you know, all the like scrolls and stuff like this, arms. Yeah. It all comes from the idea exactly. that it has to look it's, natural. It's, um, there's so much It all comes though, from, you know, from their ideas, you know. That uh, never and that was what hit me that it looked not like you expected to look at all. That basically people have been doing the same thing as they did for thousands of years after them, right through up to basically modern times. Exactly. Oh, yeah, I mean. Especially when you think about in terms of, like, if you're looking at your, your ancient philosophers, you're right, they were so deep thinkers, you know. Uh, the sort of things that they thought about that people even don't think about now. Like, you know, do you see colour like I do? You know, the idea like that. Uh, and I think it was Plato, don't you, I think it was Plato, uh, who believed that you had to be born knowing everything. Because he said you wouldn't know... What you, that, you, that something was right or wrong unless you already knew it. So he thought you were born knowing absolutely everything, but just didn't realise you knew it. Which some people would take it now as being like a sort of uh, universal spirit, universal consciousness, would really take that as being that sort of idea. But it's an interesting idea, because they just believed, if you got enough clever people in a room and they talked about it, that they would eventually discover the answer. You know, and of course, it created an environment where they were all effectively competing with each other. Yeah, exactly. You know, you know it's, um, uh, but you think about it, like it, you said, it, it's it you know, it's a brilliant subject, idea. Right? But people do tend to think they were more advanced now. But are we really? You know, it's, or is it just a case of that we're uh, using the ideas that other people came up with and had nails on top? You know what I mean? It's just we're being around longer. That's all. You know. You know, we're built on the other civilizations that have existed, and so we're just putting a couple of bricks on top of their wall, basically. Yeah. It is, yeah. You know, 
I think part of it as well is that it's like it, like you said. I think you said before that Atlantis has always uh, made a lot of people in terms of not just like uh, non-fiction and but also fiction as well. There's been a lot of fiction and a lot of films about Atlantis. You know, uh, you know, like the old like is that some old Hammer horrors and also old Hammer films and all. And I'm a person. I think everybody's done it. We're probably due for another one actually. But you know, it seems like there've been loads of them. You know. And they link it in with all different things, and it's just went into people's consciousness, hasn't it? The idea that uh, you know of this advanced civilization. Yeah, I mean, what, you know, I thought there was advanced civilization. Um, I just think that it's yeah, it's we we can never know because they haven't kept yeah they haven't kept all the uh, there's nothing nothing there to sort of symbolise. There was no photographs, cameras, or anything like that in those days. So there's nothing you can do about it to keep it. It's only what's been passed down. Yeah, because it's just, the thing is, things tend to erode very quickly as well. You know, the only way you can stop it is by burying something in the ground. If you bury it in the ground, you know, it tends to stay around for a while, which is what archaeology is based on. But, you know, if the if the stuff doesn't end up in the ground, uh, then there wouldn't be anything to find. You know, it's like uh, dinosaurs, you only find the dinosaurs that have fossils, they've got to have been near a volcano or something that's happened, and if they're not, you know, nothing occurred to make them into a fossil, then you wouldn't find them, which means there'll be masses of different types of dinosaurs that will never be discovered because they, they were never in those type of locations, they were never in the locations where uh, fossils were likely to be formed, you know? Exactly. <coughs> it's, you know, some things like you say, even like if you go back to early Victorian times, the people didn't know about dinosaurs then, I understand <coughs> about them, it's only when they discovered the bones, they found, and there's things probably we haven't found that indicate the civilization, like I say, in, in Cornwall, they were supposed to know giants, you know, people scan the ground and found it. Yeah, I know there was some uh, very tall skeletons, I said there was a tribe of them found, uh, of archaeologists, I don't know how tall they were, they were like, I think they were like nine foot, which to me is a giant, because a giant is just a tall person, but there was a lot of them, which is very interesting. There was a tribe of them that had came there and all, yeah. you know, uh, and all been buried there, which was definitely, you know, somewhere in this country anyway, somewhere in England. But you're right that there's definitely things that we haven't found. But, but there seems to be, I suppose, an arrogance that we've sort of discovered everything that a lot of people have, you know, that we've, we've discovered everything. You know, we are, you know, we are the best everything's going to get, and we're not really. You know, we're just one uh, brick on a line. That's we're just one brick in a wall. You know, and an upwards moving wall. That's all it is. You know, <clears throat> you know. And part of that isn't even about you know us. Like you said, there's, a, there's some brilliant and great thinkers of the past, uh, very deep thinkers. You know, I mean, you've also got René Descartes. You know, or Descartes. Uh, you know, I think therefore I am. The idea that the outside world might not be real. You know, you can't discern it's real. But the fact that he could think meant that that was real. So he, you know, he could think himself meant that I think, therefore, I mean, he knew he was real, but he couldn't say for certain that anything else was. And I don't think anyone's ever been able to, to uh, refute that at all. You know, the only way you could ever try mm. is by saying that you can't reason, that we're not able to reason at all, in which case you don't know anything. Uh, you know, so, yeah, and I mean, he you know, also invented, you know, uh, Cartesian coordinates and all this sort of stuff, and that's but it's using computing, engineering, mathematics, basically everything. Exactly. Now you know, yeah, it's a, it's a foundation of all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, so it is interesting, isn't it? And the thing is, that brings up another thing as well, and that is how people tend to do things. We tend to use more tools now than they did in the past. So it's easy for us to think how brilliant we are because we've got tools that they maybe didn't have. You know. Yeah, I mean, Sputnik was basically designed using uh, slide rules. They were quite complicated slide rules back then. It used to take about, I think they said it used to take about six months for an engineering student to learn to use the slide rules. Uh, but whereas now, people tend to use like this math software, yeah. like math card and, you know, Mathematica and stuff like that. Yeah. But I don't know if you've ever seen any of these documentaries where you've got a mathematician or a physicist, and they're always writing on the blackboard. But they never ever let you see any software, and the truth of the matter is, there's a lot of software solves algebra. That's what it does. 
you've still got to work out what to put in, but it means that now a lot of modern day mathematicians are more like um, software managers. Because they've got to decide what to put in the software and it solves it. Now, you know, Albert Einstein, he had a slide rule. See, you know, are we actually getting better? I mean, I know people have said that the mathematics in degrees are sort of like getting condensed now. They have to really condense it down, there's so much of it. But, but you know, are we getting any better? Is it just that we've got better tools? You know, people always tend to think that, you know, I can do all this, but is it just the tools we've got? And to be honest, most areas, I think, have some sort of tool to help them out. And people are surrounded by them all the time. You know, the phone, you know, and you've, you've got your computer, which makes things easier, you know. But maybe it makes things too easy at times, you know. Yeah, it can do. I mean, I think the life is very easy for us these days. Everything's done, you know. They don't have to look for anything. They don't have to look at map anymore. Which guy sat nav and away you go. You know what I mean? And, and people need to calculate. You know, like, everything's on our phones. It's all there. Technology's taken over. Thinking really. Yeah, exactly. It's just sort of you know, you put the put it in, then bump out comes the answer. You know. Exactly. It's all instant. You know, you don't have to do any research. You just type in. And that's why people believe a lot of false things because you know something they see on the internet and it's the first thing that comes up. Therefore, it's true. Um, and that's why people don't really look for mystery. I suppose it takes the mystery out of things a bit more. It's like years ago, if you you know, you read a book about something like ghosts or something like that, you had that book, you had to carry that book around with you or read it or. They have pictures in it, whatever. Now you just Google and they come up on your phone or whenever you like. So it's, it takes away a lot of the mystery and the research. People don't feel they've got to do much research other than looking on Google, you know? Yeah. I honestly believe that it depends on what the person does with it. I think that some people get a lot out of that, you know, because they, they learn all sorts of things that they couldn't. Because when I was younger, we had like the local library. And whatever you looked for, it probably wasn't there. <laughs> See, like I've said this before. So you had to order it. And of course they didn't, they couldn't order the book that you wanted. So you ended up having to order a different book that was supposed to be on the same subject. And you get it back and it, it was on something completely different and you learned that anyway. So, you know, it, it's much easier now. You can actually find out what you want to know and you can learn it. Because it was very hard then because you had to try and work out what it was. And you had to talk to people and sometimes nobody would really know, you know. It was just, a, it was a hard time then to, to learn some things, you know. Uh, now people put things in and at least they get some sort exactly. of an answer, then you get no answer. You get something, but it's whether it's true yeah. or not, it's looking beyond that sometimes. Yeah. But, you know, I suppose it depends on, people yeah. have to think about the sources and things like that. But, it, yeah. The interesting thing is, though, about fake news is that it's not always easy to tell... Uh, the, the supposedly mainstream newspapers from what's supposed to be the producers of fake news. Because yeah, well, there seems to be this thing that mainstream newspapers, people say, oh, it's all a big conspiracy, particularly these people, these Jeremy Corbyn fans, anything in the mainstream press, oh, it's all a big conspiracy, it's Murdoch has done it. They say, okay, what about this website? I want to have fake news. So they tend to go by blogs instead. So some sort of like 19-year-old yeah. student writes a blog and they say, well, that must be true. You know, you, oh, I don't know, mate. So you, you believe someone who's written a blog, which I could write or anyone could write, put the old crap on there, than a, a, a news source which could get sued if they publish the wrong information. You know, so it does seem to be a bit strange. People tend to mistrust the media because it seems to be a fashionable thing to say that it's all a big conspiracy and it's all controlled by Rupert Murdoch or whatever, you know. Um, but, you know. I wouldn't, yeah... I actually think it depends partly what it is or what type of media it is, to be fair. You know, I think sometimes you, you get articles and you know they've just rewrote the press release. Yeah, definitely. Some, some I don't media. trust, you know, I don't trust that when it's a rewrote press release. I don't think, you know, people do really. And some media is biased, you know what I mean? Their, their spin on the story will be radically different, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's just like, a, you yeah. know, you get a story, they can twist it to their own political agenda, and they do. You know, if you look at the way a story is reported by, say, the Daily Mail or how the Guardian is completely... Yeah. The opposite way around. Yeah. You know? It's like if someone, it's, it's, you know, if someone like a, an Islamic terrorist come running at somebody in a tank, you know, and, and is quite defending himself and stab the terrorist, the Daily Mail would be saying, "Great, another Muslim down." And they you know, it'd be sort of saying they're all the same. But where's the, where's the Guardian? They say, "Look yeah. at this thug who stabbed this poor uh, asylum seeker." Whatever. So they take their own spin of it and make a political issue out of it rather than base the facts. The truth is always somewhere in the middle. You know, if you read the extreme stories, you read the Guardian, you read the, the Daily Mail, and then you and then you think, okay, somewhere in the middle is the truth. Then you're onto something. You know, I think believing one of those sources is they exaggerate. Yeah, it just comes down to yeah. uh, reasoning for yourself, doesn't it? And not always believing, but thinking for yourself and think what you actually think is right. Yeah, well, you know, uh, 
Because there's only a problem when people don't think, isn't mm. there? Really? I mean, every you know. news source has its own agenda. Do you know what I mean? Whether they're reviewing something or reporting the story, yeah. they're going to put their own spin on it or how they want it to come across. You know, I, years ago I did some work in the media, and you see how stories would get reported. You know, um, there'd be a story like a major story, like a murder or something like this, and they'd cut out a lot of the main facts of it. Um, and only report the sort of certain things, you know, certain things that all the press would leave out or certain things they wouldn't report. And there's some stories I saw, quite, quite big stories. Yeah. There's, there's only like Reuters type things, you know, where news stories would come up. Um, and the story would come up, and bloody hell, that's an amazing story, but it wasn't even in the press the next day. And you think, well, I can't understand why that wasn't there. So you'd hear the story before the news, it's before the internet, so you'd get the, the news before it was in the papers the next day, before anybody else heard about it. But some of the stories didn't get reported or certain things... There's one story I remember, it's like a really weird story where this bloke had, uh, it's, it's on this news like a Reuters thing, where this bloke, had, he, he killed his wife, with, with, he, he had a mistress and he wanted to get rid of his wife, so he ran over and on a damn lawnmower you sit on, like the Americans have, yeah. like not one of the ones that we have, like a hand one, it's on you sit on, yeah. he had a big house, a posh bloke, he, he, uh, his wife was sunbathed and he rode over on his lawnmower and tried to push it off as an accident. Um, and obviously he'd done it on purpose, but I thought that's a bit of a gruesome story, but it wasn't in any of the press the next day. And this guy had been sent to prison for 30, 40 years, whatever it was, and it wasn't even in the papers. And that was, I thought, that's a bit strange why that's not been reported in the papers. It's obviously somebody rich yeah. and well-connected, so maybe, you know, there was some way of uh, you know, coming up, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I suppose sometimes it's just that, you know, they've only got so many pages, so they just choose stuff no, at random, yeah, you know. a story like that, you think it would make yeah. the, the, the headlines, but it didn't. You know, that's yeah. a story. So I was yeah. thinking about it, it just didn't make the headlines. Um, so, yeah, I do think some, some sort of editing goes on with the news. You know, I, there's, I tell you, really, yeah. I mean, stories I've heard about, you know, people say about the media being controlled now. A friend of mine used to work for a, a local newspaper where he lived. He's around the Newbury area in Buckinghamshire. And uh, they said to him, oh, I've got a story. This yeah. guy has, has seen a UFO. He landed and he saw this UFO. You know, aliens can have it and that. And uh, so he said, oh, he, my mate was trying to go and interview the guy and get a story. So he went around the house and interviewed this bloke. And this bloke was like, uh, 100% serious. He, said he saw this ship land. He's, he's walking his dog. It's like a countryside area in the field, and he all these beings get out, they've got silver suits on, and like massive heads, and they were walking around, and then they, they got back in this, this ship, it's like a round ship it was, and, he, and it flew off into the air, you know. Um, when he went back to his editor, his editor said, look, I had a phone call from someone, we can't print this as a serious story, you've got to change the, the text. So you're taking the piss out of him, making him look stupid, like he's drunk or delusional or a bit crazy. And they said, well, no, he's not, I interviewed him, he seemed like a perfectly sane bloke, you know, and he, and he, and he really believed this is what he saw. He said, no, we've been told that, um, you know, it's got to be reported in that way. So my mate wouldn't, wouldn't edit it. So somebody else at the newspaper changed the story, edited it, made it look like a, a joke story rather than a serious one. And the guy rang up very upset about it. My mate said, well, it's nothing to do with me, you know. So that's quite a strange story. It is a strange story, that, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. 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 There are other stories I'd like that press thing. I don't know if it's true. But if you Google this story, you will find it. It's, there's a, there's a rumour that supposedly faked the, the death of Myra Hindley. You know, that there was no one at a funeral. That was, you know, she was cremated. And it was, all, it was all done because this European Court of Human Laws, it was around that time, you know what I mean? And uh, the Labour government was in. And she was eligible um, because she'd been in prison for so long and she hadn't really committed any crimes in prison or done anything bad there. She'd been a model prisoner. But she was eligible under the Human Rights Act to be released. And, of course, none of, the, none of the governments wanted to put their hands up and say, yeah, we're the, we're the government that released Myra Hindley. So they apparently did an elaborate cover-up to, 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 you know, to, to, give, to give her a new identity and get out of prison and pretend she'd died. Well, you know, after it happened, you know, after she'd allegedly died, this woman was driving about in her car. Around Manchester, I think it was. She was like a, a nursery teacher or something like this, I think, if I remember rightly. And she bumped into this woman's car, bumped into hers. And when they both got out of the car, to obviously exchange details or whatever, she looked at her, the woman goes, she goes, bloody hell, you're Myra Hindley. She says it was her, you know. She recognised her from recent photographs. And the woman said, no, 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 you can't say that, you can't say that, and got in her car and drove off. So she rung the uh, local paper about it and also told the, the police about it. And the next day she had people knock on her door and say, there was quite heavy, like, like many black type characters saying, you're not to talk yeah. about this, you're not to mention it to anybody else, or we'll make your life hell. Uh, you didn't see anything, it wasn't her, you didn't see anything, you don't report it. And the newspaper were told, they kind of said, we're told we can't run the story. So, if that is the case, yeah. you know, that's another big cover up. But I know that could be, that yeah. could be true, because at the time when it happened, when she did die, I thought, well, that seems a bit fishy, you know. Um, I think a lot of us did, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. I think the thing is as well, though, is, with it being a local newspaper, I think you said it was local news yeah. at first. I actually think I trust that more because if you're a journalist and you're doing local news and you do it wrong, they can find you. They know where you live. Yeah. You know what I mean? Also the, 
it's not like it's like you know if you do it wrong the people in that area are going to say you know you're a bastard yeah you did this and you written this report this life would be hell from that point yeah. onwards you know you have to do a good job you do if you're in a national they're not going to find you or you're, you're a long way exactly, away you know yeah i suppose the local i mean they're all owned by none of them are that truly independent anymore they're owned by big no. organizations no. So i suppose they've still got people to answer to um if there's people above you know who own the whole network of papers around the country, then, then they have to answer to the people at the top are. So, yeah, it does seem to be a bit of that going on. A bit strange. Yeah. But at least we, on the, us on the world magic movement, at least we're uh, here to tell <laughs> the truth. Definitely. We don't cover the truth or, or, or look deeper at things rather than grant at them. We're going to look deeper at things and see see what we can find there, you know, and hopefully get people's brains going a bit themselves so they can go off and do some of their own research and come back and let us know what they found. OK, that was great talking. They've been talking to Freddie Andy, Valentine. Mate. And you mate, take care. My name's S Rob and I am talking to Sol Ravencraft. Hello Rob. Hello Sol. Yes, so I've had an interesting round of things, as you know. Exactly, yeah. I so a lot we're of what I do about protection is designed to be Sol. entertainment. Uh, I I use some of my connection and intuition as a form of entertainment, uh, as well as my interest and in, in knowledge of, of the paranormal uh, to create experiences for people, people who are curious about what it's like to participate in a seance, people that are curious about what it's like to make mental connections. Uh, and we get into uh, wishes and manifestations and that kind of thing, at a very light level, because uh, everybody is, is up for going all the way down the rabbit hole. Those are the or go deeper with, and I do. Uh, I agree. Uh, I also do some workshops and that and build about me. And so I will often have conversations with people that come up that they say, I was trying to do this, I've been experiencing yeah. this. And lately I've had several people talk to me about uncomfortable experiences in connecting with uh, uh, entities, uh, ghosts, and things yeah. like that. Uh, yeah. That just, just wasn't pleasant, wasn't comfortable for them. We talk about what they did and how they did it, and I found just this really alarming trend of people not using fundamental techniques to protect themselves before they start opening doorways. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of this comes from, unfortunately, uh, the idea of the horror film, because the trouble is people have all this baggage with them. Because there's actually quite a split here, more than you'd imagine. In the UK, people tend to use protective circles and things a lot less. It's also almost classed as an insult, some people believe, when you summon entities. So here it's much more common just to summon an entity without, uh, without actually doing anything. The problem is, is it's the horror film. See, the thing is, if you believe that you have to have these things, then you need them a lot. And the trouble is, people have seen the horror films. So they do a ritual and it doesn't match what they think it was going to be like. And so it actually creates a vulnerability. Because it's, you know, it's a tricky subject. There's a lot of different aspects and ways of looking at it. But the problem is that some people get into the occult via horror films. And so they see all the stuff in the horror films. Sure. It's got to be, and they've got all this stuff in their head as a cult, as not fiction. So when they do it, it puts them off balance and they have no idea what's going on. And it is actually quite a split, you know. In America, you'll find that a lot of people have protective circles a lot more. In the UK, uh, traditionally, people really don't use them as much. A lot of the main writers say, you just don't use them at all. I don't really use them. But like I said, a lot of it comes from the idea of fiction. And that's the thing. Like when I write a book, I try to do as much as I can to prepare people. Because a lot of the vulnerabilities are actually inside of us, do you know what I mean? And that's the thing, you see, a lot of people come from a sure. very religious background. And the problem with this is, sometimes people are thinking these entities are, this is a god, or this is a, a, a very powerful devil. And because they've been programmed to make themselves small, and to think of themselves as small, they become overwhelmed. You know, it's, you know, it's a tricky subject. Because the, the truth is, if you actually go by, uh, by actual accounts, you do get people that put a protective circle around themselves and still don't really feel uh, that they weren't affected by it. 
because it's so much of it is about the state of mind, you know. It's why it's important that people realise that they're using their will to make this happen. Because will is something we control. You control will. But if you don't know that you're doing it through will, you think the entity's doing it. You know what I mean? And then it, then they lose control. Because a lot of these things are manifestations of the person themselves. If you, if you examine them psychologically, you tend to find that people tend to, uh, you know, manifest things in ways that are that play to their weaknesses things are worried about so it's it's a difficult subject on many different levels you know but a lot of it is about the inside you know how you feel uh and you've got to know that you're manifesting it that you're doing it and that's actually the most important stuff because otherwise you're not in the driver's seat anymore Now, I have a slightly different perspective on some of what you said. Uh, I feel at least most of the horror movies that I see are uh, pretty much not doing things correctly. Uh, <laughs> and I have seen uh, uh, one that, uh, uh, that skipped, the, uh, skipped the protection steps that ever said that was a good idea. Uh, that's usually why the bad things come and get you. Um, but, uh, but I do, uh, I do feel that some of the paranormal shows, the ghost hunting shows and some of that, have shown a, a very streamlined view of what's involved with that. And they skip the sort of protective yeah. measures that some may employ because they don't feel like it's good television. Uh, and so the point where a psychic may shield themselves or they may spend time in meditation or someone may spend that time in prayer or doing some sort of casting, uh, well, they just go, well, that's, that's slow and boring. So we'll just skip that bit. And most people aren't even aware that they've done it. And, and of course, then your, your budding ghost hunters and budding occult explorers don't even realize that that's an option. They just think you grab all your gadgets and, and go. And some of the, the shows are even worse. They, they look for act, active antagonism of the entities and, and teach you to kind of bully themselves into showing themselves. And, uh, you know, you, you may get a reaction there, but it may be what you're looking for. You know what I actually, do you know what I actually think a lot of this is about? Paid skipping. It is very, very common for people who start to learn the occult to page skip. Because the thing is, some of the old grimoires, you know, they really didn't translate very well, Sol. You know, uh, they didn't translate as easy as we'd imagine. And some of them, as you'd imagine, and some of them are, uh, you know, the, the awkward. You've got to do this and you have to have nine months doing that. And people have this habit of page skipping. Uh, and they look and they think, this is, I can't do this. I don't have a goat or whatever it was. Or I don't have these candles and the page skip. Because they, th they think it's like a novel. They think it's like a whodunit. It doesn't matter. I'll just skip to the end and see that the butler did it. And they don't really understand that, that you can't page skip, you know. Uh, some things are meant to be modular, and you can do if it's, like, self-contained. But a lot of these books, they don't realise you can't page skip. Even if they're depicted as separate books, sometimes they're really effectively one book. And you cannot skip a single page. And the thing is, the old books are the free ones. You know, the really old ones, the ones that are badly translated from who knows what language. And people paid skip and they skip entire chapters because some of these things were wrote to be difficult to understand. Because back then that was how we got status as an occultist. If you wrote a book solo and no one could understand it, you got a lot of brownie points. And so what you get is people paid skipping entire sections. But the trouble is, mentally they know that, that they needed that chapter. See, that's the problem. You skip through a chapter and you see what it is. It doesn't matter if you didn't take it all in. It's not even just always the fact that you've done something wrong, which people do. It's also the fact that you know you've left something out. And you know what? The human mind likes completion. And when you know that something hasn't been done correctly, all hell will break loose. It's like if you do a ritual with passed out four candles and use three, if you do, if you, it's different from doing a ritual with three candles. If you did a ritual and you wanted to do it with three candles, that would be fine, yeah? But if you do a four candle ritual with three candles, all hell will break loose. 
And it's strange, you could remove all the candles and do a ritual with no candles and it would be fine. But because you've left some element out, because you know some element have been left out, all hell breaks loose because we aren't separate from the world. And people understand we're not separate from the world, we're not separate really from anything, including the things we're manifesting, including the things we're summoning. So when you leave something out that you know should be there, that will manifest in the entity. You know, that's going to appear in the entity, that thing that you left out. And, you know, it's just, and these old books, they weren't really wrote to be easy to do. And sometimes there's things that people don't get or they can't understand. And so it's natural for people to leave stuff out. But, you know, you really shouldn't. You really shouldn't leave anything out. Now, that's a little different from the belief that you and I share that we shouldn't necessarily be bound by the traditions in the books, yeah. uh, that that sometimes if all you got is is three candles and you want to make something happen, you can yeah. make something with yeah. three candles. You, yeah. There, there are oh, ways yeah, you can, that you yeah. can get past that, but yeah, you, yeah. you have to you have to recognize that you are you are choosing and you are altering, and you're not doing that. Yeah. You're doing something else, and exactly. and you have to believe in your own ability to be able to alter the recipe according to your needs. If, yeah, if you are at a stage where, where you're really trying to follow by rote, and you know, there's nothing wrong with following a recipe by rote. Um, yeah. that's, that's how a lot of us learn to cook, before we learn that we can make changes. Um, I, I agree with you. It's very important not to, not to skip steps yeah. there. So yeah. I've got a, a few rituals that I tend to do. I don't know what you use. I'd be interested. Uh, the the three basic things that I will use very very commonly, uh, I'm like almost daily in things that I do. Uh, the first one is uh, what I call a grounding ritual. It's a meditation exercise, uh, and essentially what you do is you imagine yourself to be a tree, and you imagine your feet. You, yeah. you, you set yourself down. You plant your feet flat on the ground. You get yourself into a relaxed and upright position. Either sitting or standing will work. Um, I suppose you can do it laying down, but I prefer sitting or standing. And you imagine roots coming out of your feet, going deep into the ground. And you imagine all of the burdens, all of the negativity, all of the stress, all of the strain, all of the obstacles to what you're trying to do just going down through those roots, all those poisons, toxins just sinking down through your roots into the ground because the earth can take it. And you just let all that stuff go. And you imagine branches coming out uh, through the top and reaching up into the sky. And you imagine a bright white light uh, lighting those branches and lighting those leaves and, and sinking in through the top of your head. And as the darker, the negative things, the toxic things wash out through your roots, uh, that positive white light, comes in and fills in all those spaces and helps flush that out. And then when you feel like you've cycled as much as you need to, you allow those branches to come in, you allow those feet, yeah. those roots to come back up into your feet, and then you are free to move and free to go about your business, and you, you tend to feel a lot lighter. Um, the uh, and and it's yeah. not something that has to take a long time. You can do it in a couple of minutes or so. Um, and I found that it's wonderful yeah. to do it in a time when I'm about to do something that makes me nervous, yeah. or I know I'm about to encounter someone or something that is difficult. Uh, yeah. To ground Good myself out, and yeah. let all that let all that energy flush, so I'm not carrying unnecessary baggage into the situation. Uh, that helps quite a bit. The other one that I'll tend to do is a shielding. And when I do readings with people, I'll tend to lead them through both of these exercises, uh, certainly with any kind of a working. Um, and it is another visualization exercise. You close your eyes. You, ima you imagine yourself surrounded by a pure golden light. And if you're having difficulty visualizing that light, you can close your eyes and look at a, a light bulb or or uh, at the sky and the sunlight, not at the sun, but uh, at the sky and the sunlight, and you'll get a very similar uh, type of light as to what you want to visualize, so you can you can memorize what that's like. And 
you just imagine this light surrounding, not just in a circle, but in a sphere, a globe of golden light, uh, which can be a cage, a grid of light, or yeah. it can it can become so bright that it becomes so solid and it blocks out everything else. And you just imagine that light becoming so bright that it completely envelops you so that everything else is lost in that pure golden light. And then you recognize that you have a dimmer, and you can dim that light down. And so you can dim the light so that you can see through it. You can dim it down so it's just like a little pilot light, a little candle flame sort of off to the side where you can know it's there, but it's not, uh, it's not in your way at all. And just know that that light is there, and you can turn it up, you can turn it down as you need to. At any point that you feel something very negative coming to you, you can turn that light up. And if it's something, uh, say, a thought, an entity, uh, a monster, if you will, that that is interfering with you, you can turn that light up to the point that 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 uh, that monster is is enveloped in the light. When you turn it back down, it'll be gone. And yeah. It's actually very similar to what a lot of druids do nowadays. It's a lot of druids do things very similar to that. And armed with those two things, you can go into a lot of circumstances and a lot of uh, exercises, rituals, connections that you try to make and be much more in control and much better protected. Uh, I'll also cast a circle. I do this fairly often. Um, I uh, when I'm at the museum and I feel like the person before me or the group before me has left a little bit of negative energy in there, uh, I will uh, do a, a quick circle. Uh, and as I do that, I, I bless and cleanse the place. Sometimes I do it with a singing bowl um, where I, I've got a, one of those brass Tibetan bowls that you run around the rim with a stick uh, that sends out a tone. And I will use that, um, uh, calling more upon that, that air energy, I suppose. Uh, and then uh, when I've got the time and the opportunity, uh, I'll go ahead and light up some of my incense, and I'll uh, do a round with the incense burner and let that burn and, and fill yeah. the space, which combines the fire and the air energy. Um, I've also done it with, uh, with just a, a, an athame, just a knife, uh, or just, just done it, just picture yeah. uh, whatever I needed there to create that space. But go ahead and walk it and acknowledge the corners uh, and all of that. And uh, I've, exactly, yeah. I've always found that to be helpful. Uh, I think that, that just calling upon, uh, I mean, just simple prayer. A lot of people aren't necessarily uh, into these kinds of rituals, um, so casting a circle may feel a little strange to them. Yeah. Uh, but the grounding and shielding, I think, uh, everyone relates to fairly well. And, and just, just a prayer. I had a situation a while back where someone called me, well, I, I called them, actually. They called the museum. They felt like something had followed them home. And I was pretty sure it hadn't come from the museum because I keep that place pretty clean. But she was describing things that were going on and, and weird stuff that was happening with electronics and that kind of thing. And, and it, yeah, it sounded like she had something going on there. And uh, so yeah. we took could also be a curse as well with electronic goods. Yeah, yeah, well. but, but just what she was describing and, and the suddenness of it, it, it made more sense that she had just maybe been a little too open on 6th Street. And uh, that was kind of a fun moment because yeah. they wanted to talk to the tour guide uh, who had led them through uh, to see what he could do about it. And uh, the people up front said, no, that's not who you need to talk to. <laughs> you need to talk to Saul. Um, <laughs> so, exactly. Uh, uh, that sort of cemented my reputation there. But uh, I called her up, and uh, she was about a couple hours away in San Antonio, so if I had to make a house call, I could do it. But I really I wanted to try and empower yeah. her to do this herself. And so we talked about yeah. uh, sort of her spiritual background. She had a Catholic yeah. background, but uh, she kind of yeah. – uh, but she was now in sort of a uh, one of those being – um, uh, uh, kind of thing. Uh, the church, what's happening now? Um, and uh, um, uh, she she felt like maybe she should talk to a priest because they believe in this stuff more. Which I, I love when people say stuff like that. Like you, you moved away from from a mode, but you feel the power is still over there. Um, I just think that's funny. Um, 
but uh, you're not going to find one to do it really. I used to do them. I used to carry the uh, the printout for uh, the exorcism of Satan and the fallen angels, and also the Roman rite of exorcism. I used to carry them in my wallet. And they actually, if you think about it as as an entity, you think about these as magical beings. Anyone can use them, and they are really good, you know. But you've got to sort of uh, know how to do it because it, you've got a lot of power flowing through you when you do that. Uh, I also wrote the protective right of Katu Bodua. That's still a good one. That was from I don't know which book it was, uh, but it was a good one. I think it was uh, I can't remember the, the title, but it was quite a long time ago. But that's a good right as well, you know, protection also pushing things away. What we ended up doing with her was I. Just after talking to her about her spiritual background and her comfort level and that kind of thing, I felt like she needed to do something yeah. now. And I didn't want to send her anything that was going to be weird and scary. I mean, you don't want an amateur to just suddenly pick up the uh, the rites of exorcism, just read this through. Uh, so what we ended up doing was I, I designed a ritual for her, uh, said, try this. If it doesn't work, let me know. And we'll we'll do something else. But I, I think this is something you can do yeah. that'll help. So I asked her first, clean up your house a little bit. Straighten it up. You don't have to do like a full spring cleaning. But neaten it up a little bit. Create some order there. Show that it's your house, that you care about this place. Own it. So do that. Uh, and then... Uh, because of her Catholic background, I suggested uh, burning incense. And yeah. she had incense that she was, was ready yeah. to work with there. And I said, what I want you to do is, is begin, uh, take the incense, take it, uh, uh, have the incense there. You're going to start by doing a prayer, uh, something that means something to you. I, I, it could be the Our Father or whatever, whatever prayer you feel has power here that will bring you protection yeah. and bring you connection um, uh, with, with, uh, with a higher entity there. And then I want you to light yeah. the incense, and I want you to go around your house, and I want you to talk to this entity, and I want you to explain that it's creating difficulty for you, and and it needs to leave. It needs to not be here. This is your house. Yeah. It doesn't belong here. It doesn't have to go home, but it can't stay here. Yeah, I, and and I don't, don't command it. Don't yeah. order it. Treat it like someone's grandma who stayed too late at the party. Right. It's time for you to go home now. And yeah. I mean, a good thing with this is, though, is like I said, is, you, is there's no such thing as overkill if you've got a lot of these entities. And there's different ways. I mean, in Islam, they just uh, talk and they just read from a holy book. That's all they do. They just read from the Quran. And in the Bible, the sections, you've got, like I said, the Roman rite of exorcism and things like this. But the thing is, there's no such thing as overkill if you've got an entity either that wants to be within you, or outside. Uh, I mean, in Christianity, normally did the sign of the cross. That was the earliest form of exorcism, okay? But that's just one uh, one area. But the thing is, there is no such thing as overkill. You can actually do, you can go around with the incense, you know? You can do the sight of Satan, or the fallen angels, and, or maybe the Roman rite. And you can do, you know, the protective rite of cattle body if you want to. You can do the whole lot. You don't have to just need to do the one, because people tend to think that I have to do just this one. You can't. There is no such thing as overkill if you have something you think is demonic or whatever. You can do all of them, because you can if you have the time. You can just go through the whole lot, and you just go through every room, and it takes a while, and you do every single one that you know. You go through the whole thing, you know. Uh, the full singing, all dancing version, you do the whole lot, and you kick them out, and they won't come back. But I, I think also that people assume that you have to be some powerful person to do this kind of thing. And with this person, I really wanted to reassure her that she had control over this. So we kept it simple. Yeah. She did the ritual. And I got a text from her. I felt like as soon as I got off the phone with her, she began doing this. And that she said as soon as they did it, things felt better. And it, yeah, well, that is normally exactly what they do. They normally start as soon as as, as soon as you've uh, contacted them. As soon as you're off the phone, they start straight away. That's exactly what the always do. But I kept do. it all within her comfort zone. I kept it all within things that she was accustomed to within her spiritual base there. Um, 
and and following a following a, a magical pattern and and she she did it herself and what i hope is that she is in a better position in future where she feels like she's got some kind of a connection that she will first look to herself and not necessarily feel like she has to call for help me yeah cuz the thing is as well people need to know this because to be blunt, there isn't many people can do it. I can do it, obviously. Uh, but, you know, I write a lot of books. You know, the fact of the matter is I'm not available to travel all the time. And your priests won't do it. And it isn't just the priests that won't do it. You check other religions. None of the other ones really want to do it anymore. You, you know, you can't call on them. And, you know, it's no good really contacting your local druid because they're pretty busy as well. Uh, you know, like he's not the guy's got a job or the woman's got a job. You know, there's just nobody to do this stuff. That's the problem, you know. And it isn't always a matter of, because they always tell you the version that you do something and then they come in. You know, that you have to have done something for these entities to arrive. And they don't. You don't have to do anything. You don't even have to believe in religion, the occult or anything, and they can still be there. You know, it's just the way it is. And there's no one really to deal with it. You know, so you're right. People have to learn how to do this because... When these things happen, there's not a, th a thing that uh, that most people can do because they just don't know. They don't even know that there's stuff on the internet they can find or things they can learn about. You know, and people just get stuck because first thing is, like, as you said, people think, oh, I'll contact the priest. The priest won't do it because the priest is thinking if this goes wrong and he's thinking the Roman right of exorcism if, or, or the right of Satan, the fallen angels, he's thinking if this goes wrong, you know... It, you know, it, it's going to be mind blowing. I'm going to end up going to hell, so he's not going to do it for a start. Uh, you know, and a lot of occultists won't do it. You know, the first one I did was because nobody else would do it. It was the same situation here, that nobody else. I was just, I wasn't even writing books at the time. I was just doing the things as, as normal. I wasn't even writing books. And it was just like, nobody else will do this. I thought, well, you know, I've got to do it. I know how to do it. I've done it before. But really, I wouldn't have, it wasn't something I would have thought of doing for other people. You know, but it was just there was nobody there. And, you know, and it, it'd be really nasty as well. Because what they don't tell you, Sol, is that even if you get, like, an exorcist, right, as in an, an actual priest that everybody thinks is the one to go for, it, it doesn't always work the first time. If it's a really nasty one, they may be, have to come back several visits. People always imagine the priest comes in and it's gone. You know what? Sometimes I have to come back again and again and again and again which is why i said if you can do the all singing all dancing version don't just do the bit that that you know about try to learn other things and do the whole lot do as many as you know about because that way you can deal it in one go and that's the way to do it to go the whole lot you just throw everything at it that you know i know people always say you know you know don't use overkill you can you cannot you know do too much so you just do everything that you can think of and you get some organized way and you go through it. And if you do that, it's gone. It will not come back. Because actually the first one I had was where a person had had uh, a priest who had been done the exorcism. And actual fact, it had started again when the priest had got on the uh, subway because it, it was someone in New York had got on the subway. So I had to do it from Skype. The first one I did for someone else. I wasn't even there at the time. But it was a case, what can I do? This person is, you know, there's things all happening, the same things I shouldn't do, there's things moving around, and the priest's gone, he says he won't come back. So, you know, the priest has went. He said, I'm too far gone, I can't come back again. So the person was literally, you know, this thing then was pissed off. It was pissed because obviously someone had tried to do something, he hadn't got rid of it, and so the person was just floating, you know. Well, but I, I do hope that I, that I mean certainly there's there's stories and and people at at your level and and my level will will hear some of the worst of the stories, which I think may tend to frighten people away from wanting to open and connect. And I guess my urging for everybody who has a curiosity is I think it's good to open yourself and explore. Yeah. Yeah. But there, there I mean, are the very thing basic is, things yeah. that you can do yeah. to keep from, atta uh, uh, from attracting the big yeah. ugly. And they're not hard to do. Yeah. They're, they're actually very simple things to yeah. do, to the point that we almost blow them oh, off. Yeah. Saying a prayer, well, what's that going to do? It does everything. 
Exactly. It does everything by, by beginning in that mode, by surrounding yourself with protection in the way that makes the most sense to you. Yeah. You can keep exactly. yourself from having yeah. to call the exorcist or having to do the big, difficult rituals. And, yeah. and I'm just urging people but not I think to skip important those message, steps. Yeah. I'm sort of saying the important thing is, like I said, is if you're reading an old book, don't skip bits. Because like, like you said before, that's an important part, is that doing a ritual with three candles is not the same as doing a four-candle ritual without the, the, with only three candles. It's not the same. Because part of the reason, I suppose, why... Uh, why things have advanced is because if you look, especially probably all occultists, but especially in the UK, is people are being quite foolhardy. Because when we experiment, when I do things, I don't always know if it's going to work. And no matter how many protections I do, there's always a potential of something going wrong. Although I always know what I'm doing, I always have got some backup plan or something somewhere, obviously. But the thing is, at the same extent, I don't skip steps. So yeah, people should try things with the occult, but they've got to realise that, you know, if a ritual's as it's wrote down, you really should follow as it's written. You know, you've got to be very careful how you do it. You know, you can experiment a bit, but realise what you're doing is something new. I mean, for me, what I tend to do is I tend to always have protection from whatever thing I'm, whatever occultism I'm doing at the time. So for me, it's a constantly changing thing. So, you know, today... It could be animal spirits. Tomorrow it could be something else. So it's a continually changing. But what I always say is, I always see my body as a protective talisman. Okay, that's how I see it. And that means I've got protection all the time. Rather than thinking it can go away. Because as long as I am there, then I've got the protection. That's how it works. But I've also got the advantage as well that I created S. Robin Victus. And that's part of his function. Because people don't realise he's always around me. You know, he's not like, he's, he's all in other places as well. Obviously, he's a magical being that created. He's a lot like me. He looks like me. Uh, you know, but obviously, some ways, he doesn't have the same human weakness as we have. But he's actually always around. So, I'm not in the situation where I'm always thinking, what happens if this happens? Because I, I know I've always got, you know, uh, my friend S. Robin Victus. I'm S. Rob, he's S. Robin Victus. I've always got him around there somewhere. You know what I mean? To take care of this. You know. So it's like knowing you've always got a mini team. Well, I think that's that's an evolution. I I, I think that it took it you did. a while to oh, sort yeah, of evolve did, into that, yeah. and that, uh, that that repetition of some of the basic concepts of uh, doing doing prayer, doing grounding, yeah. doing I would shielding, say if, casting circles, whatever yeah. makes sense to you. It eventually starts to accumulate, oh, to build and up, eventually yeah. you do become. Yeah. I mean, I actually think that, yeah. to be honest, an important point is that the prayer is the best way, for, or a spell is the best way for most people to go. Because in, if you do it daily, yeah. you'll remember it, yeah? And also, because of that, you don't need anything. You can do it every morning. But I must admit, I also do other things as well. Like, I generally sometimes move, uh, like, energy around my body, you know, like Qi Kung and stuff like that. So I actually do that as well. So if I have an injury or somewhere, I'll move the energy there to heal it, you know. So I've got that as well. I've got that yes. internal stuff as well that I don't generally talk about in the books that much because it's been covered that well by other people. But I will move energy around. So I've also got that as well, you know. Uh, so if I need to, I've got the internal, and it really it runs all the way through the body. So I can fill myself up if I need to, you know. And it's difficult to get through a body that's full of light and energy. Like that. It's tricky, you know. Uh, but yeah, the thing is, though, people should do something. Because protective magic is the one type of magic that people can use all the time. Because there may be a time when you really don't want love. You maybe don't have any money worries. But you know what? Protection is a good way for people to practice magic. Because you can do it all the time. You don't just have to do it this time or that time. You can do it all the time. And that is and absolutely, that's, it's, it's wonderful, it is, because it gives people something to do all the time, and we are practicing and keeping the technique up as well, and how to do magic and working on their own will and focusing it. So, it, you know, it's great, it is, it's for everybody. And it doesn't have to be difficult. It doesn't have to be difficult at all, no. You can use what you've got and use the type of magic that's, that really you feel is right for you. And you can use tools if you want to, you know. Uh, you can use practically anything as a tool, in fact. 
if you know how to use it. But prayer is the easiest type, prayer slash spells. Yes. Because you don't need anything, and it's easy for people. And also, some people aren't always as good as visualization as other people. People tend to be good at spells. Uh, but visualization exercises are great as well. Uh, in fact, also, some things like... Uh, I think we talked in the last episode about animal spirits. That also helps as well because you feel fuller. Because some of this stuff and the problems come from within as well. You know, if you feel you've got a weakness or a flaw there, you're easier to attack. Yes. But the most, but the most important message is is that you, it isn't the case of if I don't do anything, nothing will happen. It just doesn't work like that. You know, stuff happens to people whether you do anything or not because they're real and they're out there. Uh, but you're right, yeah. I mean, I suppose in the in the UK, a lot of the writers have had quite in their own practice have had quite an, uh, I suppose, a let's see what happens attitude. Because basically, if you're doing something new, you've got to have that attitude that let's see what happens, you know. But I myself always have a, a sense that this is going to work, you know. I'm not a suicidal. I might look like <laughs> that at times that I'm doing crazy things. But I've always I've always got a backup plan or another way. You know, and that's another thing in protection as well. If you can realise that the occult is sort of, it's sort of like uh, water. You know, it can take different shapes. It doesn't mean that every shape is as good. You know, it's like making a machine. Not every machine you can make will really work very well. But you can take different shapes. And if you know that, you can do things as well. And if you do astral projection uh, from some of the ways I've shown in my books, and you learn to take different forms and to transform in the astral realm, you can use that for protection as well, even if you're asleep. And because a lot of these entities are partly on this realm, but partly on another realm as well, if you transform in your mind, they will see the transformation as you visualize it. So if you visualize yourself as a lion, they will see you as a lion, you know, and then they will get scared because they think that you're one of them. You know, to them, then, you're this very powerful, uh, you know, creature, magical creature, and they'll just, generally speaking, the go. And that's something else as well, which is, for many people, it's, I suppose, less traditional, but I have used it on many occasions. And when they see a person who, in their own mind, is transforming, and they see that, you know, so much that you almost see it, or may see it, you will find that they will just disappear, you know. No one really wants to see a human lion or a great big dragon appear in front of them or things like this because you look such a powerful being then. You, to them, you look so powerful yeah. magically that they will disappear. They will go really quickly. They're just, they're just you know, like shadow entities, shadow demons, they run. They just go. They're just gone like that, you know, uh, because they're then thinking to them what in their mind they're seeing something which is more like a higher level devil. You know, because of that power that they only have to a limited degree and they'll just go, you know. Which just goes to show the power that humans have. We have so much power inside yeah. of us, you yeah. know, if we learn to and tap into it. I know that I'm going to include the blog entries uh, that I was talking about uh, for people that want to just see an outline of my style of doing the grounding and shielding. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have a, a couple of other yeah. links. Yeah. I encourage people to explore these and to just yeah. incorporate them, especially if you know that you're going to go and visit haunted places, especially if you know that you're going to be dealing with situations that may be challenging for you. It couldn't hurt, and you'll find that it will help quite a bit if you make this a part of your practice. Oh, no, and you're right. Once you make this a regular part of your practice, it's something that, like you said, it just sort of becomes incorporated. It just becomes a natural part of you, uh, and then it all becomes easier. But this will help you from yeah. having some of the situations people have described to me and to you where they go, well, I tried to do something, and things got yeah. really crazy, and now I'm scared. Yeah, I think an important point is as well is that sometimes it's good for people to learn things that aren't always too elaborate. And the reason for that is sometimes we're dealing with things you don't know what they are, uh, because sometimes people use protective magic when, when they realize they're being cursed. So they'll use it again to try and push it away. And it's sort of trying to compare the boxer with, I suppose, with a person who does Kung Fu. Kung Fu is very elaborate and there's all these different moves. 
but boxers can, you know, they can throw punches from any angle. And that's the thing, and that's really what it is, you know. If people can track can concentrate on as well as the more elaborate, the stuff which is simple, like prayers and spells, and even making their own prayers and spells up as well, then they'll be able to throw punches from any angle. They'll be able to deal with anything because they'll be able to duck out of the way of things, you know, and bob and weave and throw the punches in. Where otherwise they may be thinking, if all they've got is the elaborate stuff, they'll be thinking, well, I can't do this, I don't have the ball, I don't have the candles. You know, you need the yeah. other stuff as well, you know. Uh, prayers, the stuff like that, so you can... You know, you can basically attack or, or protect, should I say, you know, from lots of different ways. You can deal with well, all it's that classic things. scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark where that swordsman comes up, does all this fancy stuff, and Indiana Jones just shoots him and moves on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's exactly the picture it, yeah. you should have in your head is, is that this, this can be simple. Uh, well, uh, yeah. I hope people will uh, will take this to heart and try some of this and maybe – uh, maybe someone will send their personal experiences, their stories of uh, what they've done where they didn't uh, use protection and how making use of it has made a difference for them. Okay, great. This is S. Robin Sol Ravencroft. This has been the World Magic Movement with S. Rob, Saul Ravencraft, Freddie Valentine, produced by S. Rob. Music, A Dark Blue Arc, by Pipe Choir. Find them at freemusicarchive.org. This program is licensed for sharing under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International. For more details about usage and sharing, see links in the program description or visit creativecommons.org. This program is licensed by Werevamp Media Limited. See program description for additional links to guest sites and supporting information.